All right. Here we go. Here okay. we are. So first of all, I would like to welcome Professor Sam Vaknen, the best person to yani, present himself as Sam Vaknen himself. But firstly, I think that most of my fans know Sam Vaknen very well. I've talked before a lot on my videos, which is something like exceeding 1,000 videos about Sam Vaknen. Oh my God. But <laughs> of course, but what Sam Vaknen himself doesn't know because this is the first time to be one-to-one -one with him, that in my thesis, in my PhD about narcissism, I depended on the knowledge of Sam Vaknin a lot. And with owner, your name appeared on my thesis several times. I, firstly, for your fans, they don't know me. My name is Ahmed. I am a counseling psychologist, member of APA, American Psychological Association, member of Egyptian Association for Psychotherapists and Arab Federation of Psychotherapists. Sam Vaknin is known enough and he will present himself. Uh, uh, Sam, Vaknin, Sam Vaknin, in my own eyes, in my own opinion, I regard Sam Vaknin as a founder of modern narcissism science researches Thank since you. early Thank 90s. Everybody knows that since Thank early you. 90s. Terminologies of narcissism are with your name. I can say that you invented those terminology that everybody unfortunately uses, and most of them they don't know that you are the one who invented those names. It is the way it is so, the way of science and intellectual enterprise. We don't need we at some point the biggest compliment is if they use your work and they don't know that it is your work. <laughs> so yes. it's so it's quite I take okay. the chance to announce for everyone, from my followers and everyone around the world, that we owe a lot to Sam Vaknin for terminologists, for Thank science, you. and for everything. So, now, so, Ashko, Sam Vaknin, please present yourself to my fans. Thank you. Ashkur Akiyasidi, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you. Ashkur Habibi, <laughs> Alaikum as -salam. Thank you. Um, Darastu al-Lughathil Adabiyya Kusha fi al-Madrasa. But we will uh -huh. we will now revert to <laughs> to English for the benefit uh -huh. of our viewers. Arabic was Very actually good. Arabic was actually my second language. Uh, English, oh wow! English is my fourth language. Arabic was my second language because my father is from Morocco. So wow. at home we were talking Arabic, uh, French, and and Hebrew. So amazing, amazing, yes. amazing! It's a beautiful Sam, language. Can I can I have can I have a question? A quick question. Uh, is that the first time you go on a podcast with Egyptian or with no. Arab? Uh, in, no. It's you did that the, before? It's not the first time. Yes, I did it before. It's not the first time? No. Very good. So Arab world knows Sam Vaknin very well. Well, I don't know if they know very well, but it's not the first time. But it's the first time with such an honorable person like you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, my name is Sam Vaknin. I'll make it very short because we should discuss narcissism, not Sam Vaknin. <laughs> yes, my please. name is Sam Vaknin. I'm uh, a professor of psychology and professor of business management in in uh, CIAPS, which is uh, Cambridge United Kingdom uh, Commonwealth Institute for, uh, of Advanced and Professional Studies. It's a postgraduate institute in Cambridge. Um, before that, for about five years, I was visiting professor of psychology, clinical psychology in uh, Southern Federal University in Rostov-on-Don in Russia until the war started and I was let go because I was a foreigner. Um, and aside from that, I started my work on narcissism and as you said, in the actually late 1980s. <laughs> um, I'm, that, I'm that old. Yes. And because yes. there was very little literature and very little awareness of the condition. You're right, I had to invent a whole new language, which is currently in very wide use all over the world. Uh, part of this language I, I coined originally, and part of it I simply adopted phrases and words from existing literature, mainly psychoanalytic literature, but I repurposed the words. I imbued them with modern meaning. So the way these words are used today that's my work, but the words themselves are not mine. Um, and then I wrote uh, many books on the topic and so on and so forth. I had the first website for 10 years. 
was the only website. I had yes. the first six support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse. Narcissistic abuse is a phrase that I popularized. I was the first to describe narcissistic abuse in my book, which was published in the late 90s. And so on and so forth. So I've been in this, I've been in this field for well over three decades. Um, among the first, if not the first, probably the first, uh, for three decades. Then in 10 years later, around 2004, other people started to enter the field, this, the second generation. And now, as you well know, this is a hot button topic in psychology and definitely the most widely discussed mental illness or mental disorder or mental problem, uh, way, way more than borderline personality disorder, for example, which is pretty amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pretty amazing. Yes. This, this will, this will make me start my first question with you. Uh, uh, I, I would like to tell you that I'm done with my book about narcissism. It's written in Arabic. And the title of, yes, thank you so much. The title of the book is Narcissism is the Disorder of the Century. I and agree. then underneath, Narcissism from A to Z. And that will actually take me to the point. Sam, what do you think of this point? What do you think and why Narcissism started to spread and to increase in modern times that way? In a notable way, we can notice that narcissism increased in a clear way. What's your explanation for that? I'm going to present a nosology, in other words, a classification of narcissism, which is not very common, but I think is very helpful with your permission. There is the first layer of clinical narcissism, and that is the post-traumatic post condition. Narcissists, people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, usually have been traumatized and abused as children. They've been exposed to what we call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And as a reaction to the trauma, they develop defenses. And one of the defenses was the false self. It's a kind of imaginary friend who is godlike and is protective of the child. And that imaginary friend has all the properties the child does not possess and wish it had possessed. So this imaginary friend is all-powerful, all-knowing, brilliant, perfect. In short, it's a deity, it's a godlike entity. And then the child merges with his false self and becomes a narcissist later in life. So there is this post-traumatic reaction. Now, when I say abuse and trauma, I don't only mean sexual abuse or physical abuse. Or... I mean, for example, a parent who is absent, emotionally absent, yes. in, indifferent. A parent who is overprotective of the child, doesn't allow the child to get in touch with peers or with reality. A parent who instrumental, instrumentalizes the child, uses the child as a tool to gratify the parent's wishes and fantasies and dreams and, and needs. A parent who parentifies the child, uses the child as a parent figure. So the parent becomes the child and the child becomes the parent. That's a form of abuse. Any, yes. any refusal by the parent to accept the emerging boundaries of the child, to allow the child to separate and to become an individual, that is abuse. And the reaction to this could be codependency, could be even borderline personality disorder, if there is sexual yes. abuse and so on. But in luckily a minority of the cases, the reaction is pathological narcissism. So that's the first layer. That's the clinical psychological layer. But yes. on top of that, on top of that, like a pyramid. <laughs> We have other yes. layers, other layers. So the second layer, yes. second layer is what I call the reactive layer. The reactive layer is people want to be noticed. People want attention. People want to be seen. People yes. want to stand out. And, and today in big cities, in our modern civilization, it's very difficult to compete with hundreds of millions of other people or with billions of other people online 
for attention. So in order to be noticed, in order to be seen, you need to escalate your behavior. You need to stand out by being unique, by being special. In other words, you need to act as a narcissist. Yes. And the question is, why do we need to be seen? The need to be seen mm -hmm. is a survival strategy. Mm. A baby that is not seen is a dead mm. baby. Mm. The baby needs to attract the attention of the mother and later on the father in order to survive. So, so you are uh, connecting. So you are connecting the mode of survival mode with yes. narcissism. Yes. So it's fight, flight, freeze, survival mode. Right. Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. That narcissism is not yes. merely a clinical condition. It yes. is actually intimately linked to our primordial, initial, infantile survival mm -hmm. strategies that we develop. Mm -hmm. As a baby tries to attract mother's attention, we as adults are trying to attract other people's attention because mm -hmm. to not have any attention whatsoever is to feel dead, to, to experience death by proxy. And then there is a third layer. And that is yes. the societal layer, societal layer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our modern civilization is highly narcissistic. Mm -hmm. it, it rewards narcissistic motivations and narcissistic behaviors. If mm -hmm. you're ambitious, if you're ruthless, if you're mm -hmm. defiant, if you are driven, then you become Elon Musk, you become mm -hmm. Donald Trump. You, yes. Society rewards these behaviors, which are essentially narcissistic behaviors. So mm -hmm. society is structured in a way that narcissists rise to the top. And in order to accomplish things in life, you need to be more and more and more narcissistic. And the irony is that this is conformity. As we become more conforming, we want to belong. Yes, we want to belong. We want to be accepted. We want to yes. be part of a group. We want to interact with other people, even if only digitally. We we want an affiliation, an identity. Mm. And this is what we call mm. identity politics. Yes. So mm. today, I, identity is intimately linked and inextricably linked to narcissistic behaviors and to narcissistic motivations and to narcissistic psychodynamics. So if you look at the big picture, you have mm. a clinical condition. Mm. Then you have a survival strategy. Mm. And then you have a society that rewards you, that encourages you to be a narcissist. It is a mm. miracle that we don't have many more narcissists than we do. Mm. Because everything around you, everything inside you, encourages you, encourages you to become a narcissist. Mm. It's feeding the idea. Yes. it's it's mm. uh, We call it reinforcement. Yes. There is... There is positive reinforcement yes. for, for being a narcissist, and there are quite mm -hmm. a few negative reinforcements if you refuse to be a narcissist. Mm -hmm. So, so I can say, I can say, and can, I, I can understand from your words, Sam, that simply survival mode or, 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 or this kind of mood is simply a defensive mechanism. As we can explain narcissism with the simplest determination or the simplest words as narcissism itself is a defensive mechanism. All the behavior, all the techniques, all the tactics, dynamics of narcissism is based on defense, like gaslighting, silent treatment, ghosting, ignoring, all these sorts of behavior are based on so simple idea, which is I am defending my ego. I'm defending myself towards danger, from the point of view of nurses, there is a danger. When you criticize me, when you comment on my behavior, when you don't give me unconditional love, all this is a sort of threat and I have to defend myself. So I go on a survival mode and I start to practice the dynamics. That's great. Another question which Sam Vaknin explained before and I really like that explanation, which is the special relation between borderliner, borderline, and narcissists. Both narcissists have something to give to the borderline, and the borderline is something to give to the narcissist. 
Can you explain, please, this yes. special relation? This has to do a lot with another concept, which was uh, first described in 1989. It's not my work, um, Sander, Sander's work. And that is the concept of the shared fantasy. The narcissist yes. and, and the borderline, both of them possess a false self. But the borderline is the narcissist's mirror image. Before we come to that, it's important to understand that the etiology of these two personality disorders, the etiology is identical. They are both survivors of childhood abuse and trauma. Correct. So Correct. the first thing is they resonate. They resonate with each other. They recognize each other immediately. There is an unspoken subliminal unconscious, call it what you wish, a vibe that passes between them and says, we are one and the same. We are the same family, you know. And so this, this is the first bond that is created. The second element is that they both have a false self. And the false selves of these two are complementary. The borderline is perfectly constructed and suited to uphold and support and buttress the narcissist's false self. For example, the borderline sustains the narcissist's grandiosity. She regards the narcissist as a godlike figure that she can admire and worship and cherish. And, and the narcissist regards the borderline as someone in need of saving or rescuing, someone he can act as a god to. She can be his, his worshiper. She can be in his cult. It's a cult-like situation. And the third element is a shared fantasy. Both of them required a fantasy in order to survive. The borderline's fantasy is an external regulator, someone in, on the outside that can help her to regulate her emotions and her moods, to stabilize them, to afford her a sense of safety and predictability and certainty. So she's looking for a rock, a rock around which to construct her fantasy, someone who is a special friend or a special person, someone who is a father figure, someone who is... So in the, so the narcissist, because the narcissists project self-confidence, they project omnipotence, all being all-powerful. They project omniscience. They project a godlike figure. So the borderline finds it very easy to bond with the narcissist and to cast the narcissist in this role of an external regulator. On the other hand, what the narcissist requires is a mother figure. He requires a mother yes. figure in his shared fantasy. Yes. We should not forget that narcissists emotionally, psychologically, are anywhere between two and six years old. Closer, closer to two years old, actually. Yes. And so they're looking for a mother all the time. And the borderline is in the perfect capacity to provide a maternal figure because she is a close replica or clone of the narcissist's original mother. So here they can create a shared fantasy. In this shared yes. fantasy, the narcissist is the protector, the savior, the rescuer, the provider, the regulator of emotions, stabilizer of emotions, the stabilizer of moods, the all-knowing figure, the father figure, the, I mean, a god. It's a religion. It's a private religion within this cult. Yes. yes. And on the other hand, the borderline is the caring, um, engulfing um, mother who provides the equivalent of a symbiosis. It used to be called the symbiotic phase. They create a symbiosis and they merge and fuse and become a single organism with two heads. And I can, I can add, yes, I can add to this deep analysis, deep psychoanalysis to the relation between a borderline and the narcissist, another common ground between the narcissist and the borderline. The narcissist behavior is so difficult to be taken or to be accepted by most of the normal personalities. Meanwhile, the borderline is having a deep fear of abandonment. So as if someone is abusing and when the borderline get bored of that and decide to leave, 
something inside, something deep inside in the borderline say, shout, no, please go back. Go back to this maternal figure. Go back to this person that will share me the fantasy. And then, of course, that's something so nice for the narcissist that someone is taking and accepting all these behaviors and giving somehow unconditional love. So it's a bond. It's a tie. Yes, Sam, you, there you is touched, another you point. On, with your permission, you touched on two very important issues. The borderline yes. has what we call the twin, the twin anxieties. Yes. She has she has separation insecurity, which is colloquially known as abandonment anxiety, and yes. she has engulfment anxiety. She is not only afraid to be abandoned and rejected, but she is equally afraid of being consumed and digested and, and to vanish. So she is going through cycles that are known as approach, avoidance, repetition, compulsion. She approaches, then she avoids, she runs away. She comes back, she runs away again, and so on and so forth. The narcissist is perfectly suited to react to these repetition cycles or compulsions because yes. the narcissist also has his own approach avoidance cycle. He has mm -hmm. idealization, devaluation cycles. So mm -hmm. the narcissist pushes the borderline away exactly when she needs to run away. This is a perfect match in this sense. That their cycles are totally synchronized. That's a, an, an important point. And, and yes, the narcissist tests, all the time tests his partner. The narcissist is a child. So the narcissist is saying, I'm going to see, I'm going to verify that my partner is a real mother, that she loves me unconditionally, that never mind what I do to her, Never mind how I misbehave, she's still going to love me. So he abuses her. He pushes her away. He attacks her. He undermines her. Everything. But it's, it's a test. It's just a test. And yes. if she passes this test, then she's a real good mother. Good enough mother. Because that means her love is unconditional. It does not depend on the narcissist's behavior or misbehavior. All these dynamics are taking place in the in the shared fund. Just a question came to my mind when you are talking about borderline and narcissist now. Just a question came right now. Of course, you know, the four styles of attachment that was developed during childhood, which is anxious, disorganized, avoidant, and secure. How you classify, how you explain the attachment of a narcissist and the attachment of a borderline? They're both, uh, they both have an insecure attachment style. This classification was first proposed by Bowlby and uh, later developed by others. Right. So they both have an insecure attachment style, but with different emphases. So the narcissist would have a more, um, an attachment style that is, that is more avoidant. Yes, exactly. That is more yes. avoidant, a, a bit more aggressive and so on. And, and the, the borderline, borderline have, is tending to anxious? Yes, the borderline would, would, would be a lot more anxious. So the borderline, yes. the borderline's uh, attachment is very similar, very reminiscent of the codependent attachment. And the difference between the borderline and the codependent is the codependent is conscious, conscious of her attachment style and uses it to manipulate the partner. The codependent emotionally blackmails the partner and she does it knowingly. And so she says to the partner, I cannot survive without you. I cannot live without you. I cannot function without you. You owe me. I sacrifice a lot for you. And so on. This is the codependent style. Whereas the borderline does exactly the same thing, but she's totally unconscious of this. She is, it comes from, you know. But generally speaking, yeah, these are two insecure attachment styles that are perfectly suited because the borderline needs the avoidance style because she needs to run away from time to time. Of course. She yes. needs her freedom from time to time. Yes. And yes. the narcissist needs someone with an anxious style because he yes. likes his partner to be dependent on him. He likes yes. the partner to be dependent on him. Right. He conditions the partner to be dependent on him because that's the only way that mommy, mother, will not abandon him. So there is a perfect that's match good. here between narcissist yes. and borderline. They, they cope together, they cope yeah. together. They, they complement each other. Uh -huh. 
one one of the things that I want Sam to explain to our followers and projects. This terminology is one of your special terminologies that you've explained perfectly. So, so to all our friends all over the world, Sam want to tell you something about and projects <laughs> and the mind of the narcissists. So I, I wish it, I wish it were my work. It's not my work. <laughs> in, introjection okay. is a, a basic term, a very important term in the work of what is known as the object relations schools. The object relation schools were a group of thinkers, a group of scholars and psychologists over a period of something like 25 or 30 years in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And they came up with a four-stage process based on Freud's work and other, you know, but they came yes. up with a four-stage process. Internalization, identification, introjection, and incorporation. Yes. Now, I will not go into all the details here, but I will focus on, on two important elements. What they were suggesting is that sometimes, because we are afraid to lose somebody, we are afraid to be abandoned, or because we have decided actually to lose somebody, we have decided to separate and move on. As children, what we do, we create a representation of that important person in our mind. So if you're a, a child, a two-year-old child, and you're afraid to lose mommy, you're afraid she will abandon you, because she keeps leaving the room, she keeps frustrating you, she keeps disappearing on you, there's no object permanence or object constancy. So what you do, you create a copy of mommy, a photograph, a snapshot, an avatar, call it as you wish, and you internalize it. It's in your mind. And now mommy is in your mind all the time. There's no risk of abandonment. That's one solution. The other solution is when you want to separate from mother, when you want to become an individual, that is induced separation and individuation exactly the malice separation individuation that is an induced loss you're choosing to lose mother but it's still terrifying isn't it you're two years old and there's a whole wide world out there so you create an image of mother and you internalize it so internalization fulfills different functions now similarly you are going to internalize whole relationships. What you're going to do is you're going to divide your mind in two or in three, whatever. And then the parts of your mind are going to interact with each other, simulating a relationship you have with someone. So these are the two types of ident in, uh, internalization and identification. Introject, introjection is the voice, the messages that these internalized representations have. When you internalize mother, you don't only internalize her image, you internalize everything she's ever told you. She may have told you, you're wonderful, you're lovable, you're gonna succeed in life. She may have told you, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're good for nothing, you're inadequate, you're a total failure. Whatever the case may be, the image of mother in your mind, known as the introject, carries with, with it mother's messages, mother's voice, mother's constant signaling inside your mind. And this is known as the introject. In the context of narcissism, what the narcissist does, he creates an introject inside your mind. He creates a representation of himself or of herself in your mind. And this inter uh, representation in your mind, this avatar... So simply we can simply we can uh, uh, simplify and project as absorb voice of the mother? Absorb voice of anyone, not only mother. You can yes. in interject anyone. So if you're yes. in a relationship with a narcissist, you will interject the narcissist. There yes. will be a small narcissist inside your head, and this narcissist yes. will keep talking, will keep having a voice long after the real narcissist has left your life. Exactly as you would remember your mother and father long after they are deceased. 
after they're dead. They're and that's screaming. one of the good reasons. Uh, and that's one of the good reasons why narcissists overcome their victim's mind. Yes. They, in, they insinuate themselves into the victim's mind, abusing, abusing the process of internalization and introjection. And, and that is a big problem because it's easy, it's it's not easy to get rid of this introject. And the reason it's not easy is that the introject of the narcissist collaborates with other introjects in your mind. It creates coalitions with other introjects in your mind that have the same negative message. So if the narcissist is abusive towards you, if the narcissist criticizes you all the time and so on, the narcissist's critical voice will remain in your mind and it will make a collaboration, a coalition with other voices in your mind that have the same negative message. So it, this voice is amplified by other interjects. And the whole process is known as entraining. Entraining is a recent discovery. Yes. It's a recent discovery in neuroscience. We discovered, I'm saying we because I'm a professor of neuroscience. So we discovered that um, people who play music together, their brain waves become totally synchronized. We cannot tell the difference whose brain is it. They become one harmony, a sort of brain. harmony. Yes, high brain, totally harmonized. Yes. Yes. And so the narcissist does this to you. The narcissist verbally abuses you using the same words again and again and again. It's like hypnosis or like a mantra, some kind of mantra in meditation. And the narcissist actually entrains you, synchronizes his mind with your mind, allowing him entry to your mind, access, and then he implants the introject. This is the, the process, which is very terrifying. You know, in one word, brainwashing. Mm. <laughs> brainwashes. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a sort of, of brain. But, uh, uh, since we have Sam Vaknin with us, can you please explain to us your way or the recommended ways to treat a narcissist from his disorder? Because usually you find some people are using techniques like DBT or CBT, and they depend completely on DBT and CBT on treating a narcissist. Is there anything you can add to us, you can learn from you about treating a narcissist? First of all, it's no treatment modality that I'm aware of has any efficacy with narcissism. And that includes schema therapy, that includes EMDR, that includes Millen's uh, work, that includes Kernberg transference therapy, that, trust me, <laughs> in the last 30 years I've studied all of it. Gestalt, see it. <laughs> Gestalt, the transactional <laughs> analysis, I mean, you name it. Yes. None, of yes. Them, yes. none of them succeed with narcissism because narcissism is, is an absence it's not a presence. There's nobody there. There are two core mistakes in the attitudes of psychology or psychotherapy to narcissism. Mistake number one, they, they relate to the narcissist as if it were an adult. It's not an adult, it's a child. We need to use child therapies. Second mistake, narcissism is a post-traumatic condition. We need to treat it with trauma therapies not with cognitive behavior therapies. Right. So that's that's the source of the of the of the problem. Now we can modify, we have been successful at modifying behaviors of narcissists, especially abrasive antisocial behaviors. But these modifications are short term and they're totally reversible. We cannot maintain them in the long term. So a few years ago I designed a treatment modality specifically for narcissists. Uh, called therapy. It's a modality that builds builds on the work of Foa and Nozak and a few other psychologists in the 80s. And it, it uses re-traumatization, uh, putting the narcissist through trauma again, through the primary, of course, not in the physical sense, yes, in the verbal yes. sense. Uh, putting the narcissist through the trauma again, 
and demonstrating to the narcissist that he can survive or she can survive the trauma without narcissism. That narcissism is not needed to survive the trauma. Mm. And is, so is this technique close? Uh, is this technique you developed this close to a technique called treatment by shock? So this is a kind of exposure therapy. If if you want, like that. like like when we like when we treat someone from, for example, uh, a kind of phobia or something. Exactly. Sometimes this is, we use. Sometimes exactly. this we is use called treatment exposure. by shock. Exposure. Yes. Therapy, yes. Exposure. Right. Right. Exposure. Right. So, it's a kind of exposure therapy. Uh, it involves many other things. Uh, Twenty-five techniques that I developed that are proprietary and so on. I'm I've been certifying and training therapists because this should be administered only by a licensed therapist, of course. Even I cannot administer it because I'm not a licensed therapist. But of course, I can train therapists. Unfortunately, the pandemic interfered and uh, <laughs> we have to yes. restart, restart the whole process. We succeeded to train 150 therapists before the pandemic, but now yes. they need retraining because a lot of time has passed. But I think this technique stands a chance, at least, to break through the defenses and prove to the narcissist that the false self is not needed, that he can survive without the false self. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it will work. I'm not quite sure, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Mm -hmm. But right. we, we, so, have, we have one minute left. We can, we can hang up now and you can click yes. on the same link and we can continue. Yes, please. Yes, yes please. If you wish. So I, I, I go back, I go back and I, I will, click I will on hang the, up now. Uh, Wait, yes. at least wait five minutes because it is saving yes. the file. Right. And then just click on the same link and we will continue our conversation. So after five okay. minutes. Okay. All right, sir. All right, sir. <laughs> See you. Ma uh, one more time. I would like to make um, an observation before we proceed, if you allow me. Of course. But on the online environment, which is always a polarizing extremist environment on every issue, not only on narcissists. Yes. We, tend, we tend to demonize narcissists. We tend to say that they are malevolent, evil creatures who are hell-bent on destroying people's lives and so on and so forth. And of course, the outcomes of narcissistic abuse are indeed very destructive to other people. People are damaged and broken and harmed in big ways. Um, I'm even an advocate of criminalizing narcissistic abuse. But we should not confuse and conflate narcissists with psychopaths. Psychopaths are goal-oriented. They are premeditated. They are cunning. They are scheming. They, are, they have a criminal mindset. Narcissists have the same impact like psychopaths. They are as, as horrible and destructive, but they are driven by inner uncontrollable impulses. They are delusional. They are immured. They are immersed in fantasy and they believe the fantasy. When they make a promise, they believe they're going to keep it. Yeah. When, they, when they gaslight you, they're not actually gaslighting because they're not even lying. They believe their own nonsense, you know? Mm -hmm. So they are delusional children who would rather live in fantasy than in reality, and whose emotions, negative emotions, negative effects, um, are not under control. There is a problem with impulse control. <clears throat> On many situations, the narcissist becomes as emotionally dysregulated as the borderline. For example, when the narcissist is shamed or humiliated in public, when the narcissist is challenged and his grandiosity is undermined. That is known as narcissistic injury. Narcissistic rage is a perfect example of emotional dysregulation coupled with impulse, lack of impulse control. So narcissists are much less organized than psychopaths. Psychopathic uh, personality is actually highly organized. And they, these people are highly efficacious high functioning, while the narcissist personality is chaotic, disorganized, infantile, regressive, impulsive, dysregulated, total mess. 
there is no and, and, controlling and, and, and that's why no and that's why we we classify i'm sorry for interrupting and that's why we classify narcissism and psychopathy as cluster b and that's why we use the word delusional and not illusional as we use yes. the word illusion for cluster a more yes exactly i i personally think that it is a mistake to include psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder together with borderline or together with narcissism, because borderline and narcissism are manifestations and expressions of internal dynamics, hmm. while the psychopath is a manifestation and expression of external dynamics. Nar hmm. uh, psychopaths externalize, they externalize hmm. aggression, they externalize, hmm. while the narcissist in, hmm. in, in borderline, they live inside their minds. They're totally mm. cut off from reality. They have impaired reality tests. So mm. I think it's a mistake to confuse the two. I also have my mm. doubts whether psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder are mental illnesses. The mm. very word antisocial. <laughs> that's a social problem. <laughs> not a not a so there's a question. I just I, I I just smiled because a couple of months ago I have recorded a, a video and I've said the same. Mm -hmm. I've said I have big doubts that psychopathy in particular is regarded to be mental yeah. men, mental illness mental mental disorder yeah. more than personality disorder since I we think, are talking about it's psychopathy a yes. problem. it's a social problem yes. but we mm. should not we should not pathologize and we should not medicalize socially mm. unacceptable behaviors mm. it's like the communist party medicalized mm. and pathologized dissent mm. so dissidents mm. In, in the USSR, dissidents were put in mental hospitals because they were diagnosed by psychiatrists as insane. It's insane to oppose the Communist Party, you know? So, so if, I fully, if I fully understand you, you can say that psychopathy is organized and goal-oriented behavior. Yes. But we can say that narcissism is more defensive mechanism, is yes. not really oriented towards abuse or it's just to defend the threat yes more it is. Than exactly and it's also very chaotic it's very it's mm -hmm. very disorganized in the sense mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. narcissism random random it's more random it's less yeah. goal oriented yeah. it's not linear mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. no clear mm -hmm. vision or mm -hmm. it's just a survival survival mode mm -hmm. constant survival mm -hmm. mode you know mm -hmm. whereas a psychopath is, up, is after money mm -hmm. or sex or access mm -hmm. or power Psychopaths are very good. Already. Very good. S since since we have some with us, so we have to take the advantage with your advices for everyone. Since those defensive mechanisms practiced by nurses towards the maybe we call it the victim. I don't know it's correct or not, but anyway, to the person will be abused. How to protect yourself? How to protect your children in case you have a family life with a narcissist. What is the best way to protect yourself? Basically, there are two ways. If you're forced to be with a narcissist, if for some mm -hmm. reason you cannot go, no contact. And in, in mm -hmm. 1995, I suggested 27 strategies. And yes. I, gave, I gave them the name, no contact. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot give, no, if you want, cannot go, no contact, you're married and you cannot divorce or you are financially dependent, or you have many children with a narcissist, or for whatever reason, you cannot, there's no way you can escape the narcissism. So you're working in the same workplace and you don't want to give up on your career, you know. There are many situations where we cannot avoid or evade the narcissism. <laughs> then there are two strategies, essentially. Once, and they're both not pleasant, but <laughs> the first strategy <laughs> is to leverage the narcissist's grandiosity against the narcissist. It's like in martial arts, when you use the momentum of the adversary against the adversary. So yeah. if you flatter the narcissist, if you tell the narcissist how great he is, what a genius he is, how amazing he is, how unprecedented, yeah. how these are that, you can make the narcissist do anything you want. Narcissists are junkies, they're drug addicts. They're addicted to narcissistic supply attention, admiration, adulation, being feared, any form of attention. So if you give the narcissist attention 
and you modulate it and you know how to give it so that the narcissist doesn't suspect that you're faking it. You have to act. Then you can make the narcissist do anything you want. You can go you to mean, the narcissist. You mean, you mean to give the narcissist supply as one S or to give the four, four S's supply, sex, service, sadism? What do you mean? One S or the four S's? So yes, if you strike a deal with the narcissist that you provide him with the four S's, and not mm. all the four, out of four. Mm. Two out mm. of four are enough. Sex, okay. sex services, supply, mm. narcissistic mm. or sadistic, sadistic mm. supply also, and mm. uh, and uh, um, safety, being mm. present, not abandoning the narcissist. Mm. If you're willing to play this game, the narcissist mm. is yours. Narcissists mm. are incapable of telling mm. reality apart from fantasy. They mm. and and they will. They, they tend to believe that they are great and they are geniuses and they are amazing and so on. It, it's, a, it's an easy job, basically. And then What's, what's better, them. Sam? Yeah. What's better? What's better for the victim to have somehow peaceful life with the narcissist? To give two or three S's or to enter the four narcissistic codes? So, I of, think... Of that, course, you know them very well. Yes, I think that... I want to... I want to um, propose two strategies because I don't want to become too complex. I want people to remember right. one of two things. Okay. So okay. one thing is to tell, to agree with the narcissist's grandiosity, to support it, and then mm -hmm. narcissist is yours. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate, you can ask anything, especially if you mm -hmm. make the narcissist believe that the mm -hmm. idea is his idea. Something you mm -hmm. want, you should make the narcissist believe that he wanted it or he's helping you, he's saving you, he's mm -hmm. rescuing you, you're in need, you cannot survive without him. And so on and so forth. Mm. The second mm. strategy is fear. Fear. Mm. To establish firm boundaries with sanctions and punishments. And whenever the narcissist crosses these boundaries, and violates them and breaches them, to mm. punish him. And the punishments need, punishments need to be severe. Mm. Narcissists are cowards. They're children. Mm. Maybe not. not that's you mean uh, don't 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 revive? Uh, don't don't trigger the fearful child inside the narcissist. Yes. So unfortunately, it's a strategy that works well. We mm. know that it works well. For example, because when narcissists go to prison, mm. all their narcissistic behaviors disappear. Mm. Of course, if you are a narcissist in prison, you don't survive for long. Mm. So suddenly, all the behaviors vanish. They are completely different people. They are caring and compassionate and atten attentive. And they are, they, the narcissism vanishes. This teaches us that narcissism to a large extent is, as you said, a defensive survival-related posture. And when survival requires the suspension of narcissism, then it disappears. It's a choice. It's in effect a choice. So if you were to create for the narcissist an intimidating environment, a fear-based environment, an environment that involves punitive measures and so on, if he misbehaves, if he breaches mm -hmm. boundaries and mm -hmm. rules and so on, that should work. That should definitely mm -hmm. work. Think of the narcissist as a two-year-old. What would you do with your two-year-old? Do it mm -hmm. with a narcissist. Simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. And about children, how to protect the children in case that the victim cannot leave and we still have uh, children between us and the narcissist. Is it right to tell the children about their father, for example, or mother, it depends, behavior, disorder, or to hide it till a specific age and then to start talking about it or not to talk about it at all and to treat the situation normally? There are dif differing opinions. There, are, there's a, mm. there's a debate. My approach is based on social learning theory, Bandura's mm. social learning theory. Bandura mm. said that it is a mistake to actively inform and educate children. Mm. Instead, you should act. You should mm. be a role model mm. so that children can imitate you and emulate mm. you. You should show them an example of how to behave, mm. what decisions mm. to make, what choices mm. to, to adopt, and so on and so forth. And then they will imitate you and become like you. Mm. So if you co-parent, if you're a co-parent with a narcissist, mm. I think 
my recommendation is simply to, to behave in a way that would be an alternative to the narcissist so that mm. the child can see two models, two possibilities, the narcissist yes. or you. And mm. then the child can make a choice. I want to become mm. a narcissist like my father or mm. I want to become a healthy, normal, balanced, happy person mm. like my mother. Mm. or vice versa doesn't matter so mm. 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 the child would have a choice of modeling now studies right. have shown studies have shown quite uh, conclusively mm. that children usually adopt the healthy model mm. in other words if you are consistent with the child over the child's life from 2 years mm. old to 18 years old or 25 years old and you're consistent you're healthy, you're boundaried, you're grounded, you are compassionate, you're empathic, you're helpful, etc., etc., etc. And there is the other parent who is selfish, who is rageful, who is unboundary, who is impulsive, who is reckless. Who is... The child may, throughout this period, imitate the wrong parent, but ultimately, when the child becomes an adult, the child is much more likely to adopt the healthy model, the right mm. parent. Mm. So it's a risk, but a very limited risk. I don't Sorry, believe, I will... I don't believe mm. in confrontation mm. between the parents. I don't believe in telling mm. the child, listen, something's wrong with, mm. with your father, mm. with your mother. Don't be mm. like that. This is counterproductive effect. Children, mm. for example, in adolescence, mm. they are defiant. Mm. They, they're likely mm. to push back. Parental alienation mm. is a major problem mm. also. Mm. So there if you if you try to attack the other parent, the child may choose mm. the other parent to protect the mm. other parent. So you mm. may end up pushing the child to the other parent. These are all mm. very problematic and dangerous strategies, if I mm. Mm. just be yourself. Just be a good mm. person. Let mm. the child be exposed to a bad person and a good person. Mm. And let mm. the child decide. Most people Choose to be good. Mm. Most people are good people. <laughs> That's a fact. All right. I, I, I will tell you my point of view because I, I actually, when I'm asked about what to do in this sensitive situation, I say exactly what you say, but I add a little point. I always advise, do what Sam said exactly. Be a, a role model. Be a good model. I'll let the child to choose the right model for him or for her. But I add one point more, that when you attack, when you talk, when you criticize the narcissist, say to the child, say to your son or daughter, first of all, before I talk about your dad, I want you, my son, to differentiate between two things, between behavior and the person. He is your dad as a person, we give him a lot of attention, we, look, we give him a lot of respect as a father model. So I'm not talking about your father. I'm talking about your father's behavior. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing, I'm not criticizing your father or narcissistic mother. I'm criticizing the behavior, which is lying. Lying yeah. as a behavior is bad for that and that and, and these reasons. For example, gaslighting, for example, ignoring, for ex any, any sort of behavior. So we differentiate between two things. The yes, person, but it's difficult for a child to make this behavior. distinction. This is very adult distinction. A child would yes. interpret this thing is attack on the father, yeah? No. But I agree with you that you need to teach the child boundaries. For example, no. you need yes. to teach your child, yes. if daddy mm. asks you to do this, don't do mm. this. Mm. This would prevent, for example, sexual abuse. It would mm -hmm. prevent criminal behaviors. It would prevent mm -hmm. unethical behaviors. It, so mm -hmm. you need to, to teach the child where to put the, the, the line. Where's the line? Where Which line mm. never to cross? Even if daddy asks you, don't do that because it's not okay, it's wrong, and so on. Um, I think if you lie all the time, if, uh, sorry, the father lies, on, if the narcissist lies all the time and you never lie or rarely lie, the child will, will notice the difference. The child will be disappointed mm. because the narcissist mm. will lie to the child, will make promises mm. and then break those promises. And so on. gradually the child will learn to not trust the narcissist and mm. to trust you because of experience and exposure. Mm. The narcissist would promise to come to the child's birthday once, twice, three times, and will never come. Mm. You will promise to come, 
and you will mm -hmm. always come. So the child begins to realize this person I can trust, this person I cannot trust. I think teaching by modeling, it's not my idea, it's Bandura's idea. It's teaching by modeling mm -hmm. is, is a really, really great idea. And of mm -hmm. course, you're right. We need to teach a child what not to accept, what to reject, mm -hmm. which boundaries. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, Sam, don't you think this is also a child, you know? Don't you think that we need Sam Vaknen to visit Middle East soon or to come to Egypt? Or you know, I wish that you come to Egypt to get the best use of your knowledge. You come for a lecture, you come for a seminar, you come for anything. So at least if you don't have a plan for this, promise us that one day you think about it. And of course, so promise me that this is not going to be the last time to Thank learn you. from you, to learn from your knowledge. Promise me Thank you. that I will... Yani, have the honor to be with you on my podcast or to accept my inv invitation one more time and three times and four times. Of course, a pleasure for me. I really my enjoy pleasure. each my word pleasure. you say. Thank you, Thank you so much. You have, a, you have a deep knowledge of the of the topic that is clear. The Middle East is a Thank sad. You. The Middle East is a sad story of yes. a family of brothers and cousins who are killing each other and fighting each other. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally mm -hmm. unnecessary. If these mm. families stood together, who is the United States? Who is China? Mm. If we mm. if we all stood together, you know. Mm. But unfortunately, Let we are much much better at killing each other and fighting each other than at collaborating. And that's let's pray all of us with all our religion. Let's pray from heart for peace to reveal the world for peace to be the the, the atmosphere that we all live together. And we, we learn from each other and we cope together for a peaceful life. Inshallah. Sam, thank you so Inshallah. much. I really, really appreciate your time. And okay. with a promise, you will be with me another podcast. Uh, we can end the record now. And I would like to say something after the, the record, Yani. We can cut this later, Yani. Okay. And of course, Yani, promise me that you will be with me thank when you. your time allows, of course. Okay. I, will always respond, for me. I will always respond to your invitation positively. Thank you so much. And I'm waiting for the link. And we'll talk. Habibi, Habibi, Habibi. And I'm waiting for the link. You can send it to me on WhatsApp. I will. To download will. it. Yani, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And see you soon, inshallah, in Egypt. See you soon. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> you have a brother. You have a brother in Egypt. You have a house in Egypt. Yani, it will be a pleasure for me. Thank you so much. Ma'asalam. Ma'asalam, Habibi. Ma'asalam.